we record an interview that went partly into the Glitch in the Matrix film, and it was shared, like a few people took clips of it and it was widely shared. I think one of them got about 250,000 views. In total, probably about half a million people saw that interview. Yeah. Um, and what we talked about a lot was the female shadow mm -hmm. and the idea that what we, we are, we're living in a culture that, especially with Me Too, has got a sort of real exposure of the male shadow. And these sort of ways that men have acted out and but and this kind of ongoing narrative of toxic masculinity but we have no no one talks about toxic femininity and how it's a really unbalanced conversation did what were the sort of responses that you got to that so i got a lot of responses from men around the world really thanking me for speaking up for for saying something that they don't feel that they can speak and they they haven't heard other women say so they really thank me for bringing a voice to something that's there, but it's not spoken about. There's no permission to speak about these things. And I had also women messaging me to say, thank you for showing up in this way. Thank you for showing womanhood. Um, so there's something about a way and a conversation that we haven't brought into the picture that, that somehow resonated with many people. And also, I know that there were some people who thought that you were speaking from a position of internalized misogyny. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's, you know, that's the first thing that people are going to question. Where's this woman com coming from? Because she's saying something that you're not allowed to say. And of course, I had a lot of self-reflection about, is that true or not? And of course, as a, I grew up in a patriarchal society. I grew up with these, with these values. I grew up feeling as a girl and as a woman that my voice was not was not as important and as uh, and is worth listening to so i had to think about has that been internalized in me and i would say yes and no but i know very well how it is to be a woman and i know how it is to be a woman in a public space so the place that I'm coming from is really from, from an experience of being a woman and also being in a deep relationship with a man that teaches me about how is it to be a man. And as a mother of two young men as well that are developing their masculinity in contemporary society, that teaches me a lot. And that's the place that I'm speaking from. It's really from this embodied experience of being a woman right now. This is what I wanted to... To, to say about the Me Too movement, that yes, it has exposed male shadows, but it has, has definitely also exposed female shadows. This blind aggression, the blind projections that are going on towards men. And this is what, this is what we are not allowed to talk about. And this is what is important for women to really look at and to really have a sane self-reflection about how are we actually trying to create the space that we are missing? Are we trying to create it from the place of the shadow that we are attacking? We are becoming the perpetrators ourselves, our aggressive and unreflected voices. And it's You mean sort of attacking people by playing the victim? Attacking men, basically. Attacking men for being the perpetrators, but in a way that we do it ourselves. Instead of taking the space and filling it with what is it actually to be a woman? This is really, this is missing. What is being exposed now that being a woman is that we have so much power and we are going to use it quite irresponsibly. This is what I see with the Me Too movement that it's gone too far. It's like we are, we are becoming increased with our own power. So we're just going to, we're just going to get at it instead of saying, Okay, women, sisters, what do we want to do with this space that we have created? Because I guess what we're saying is, yes, Me Too exposed male shadows, mm -hmm. but we all have shadows. Mm -hmm. Women have shadows just as men have shadows, and they're probably different. Yeah. And also there's some sense, like Harvey Weinstein is now facing, he's been charged with rape, he's facing a long time in jail, potentially. So for a long time there was this kind of narrative of, well, the patriarchy, Harvey Weinstein was facilitated by the patriarchy. It's like, well, that same patriarchy, the legal system, the structures that we've built in society has now held him accountable. Mm -hmm. And it looks like he's probably gonna to go to jail. And actually, I would argue, if, 
if people, both men and women, within, within his circles had spoken up earlier and taken moral responsibility, rather than accepting payoffs and rather than kind of, and, and actually stood up and said something, we wouldn't be in this situation now. So you could say, oh yeah, well it's a corrupt system, I'd agree, but it was only corrupt because the people in, in it were corrupt. Mm -hmm. The actual system itself, when people spoke up, is functioning as it should. Mm -hmm. The justice system is functioning as it should. And this, I think, could perhaps, for, for me at least, draw a kind of before and after moment. Because for a long time, there's been this sort of sense of, and you've actually heard people say this, it's like, men, now is not your time to speak. You just have to listen. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that, and, and I have been listening to a lot of the, the, the stories that have come out, and a lot of them are horrific, and it's like a real point of kind of reflection. But it can't stay there. Because if it's just one person speaking and another person listening, by definition, that's not a relationship. Mm -hmm. A relationship, by definition, is you speak, I listen, I speak, you listen. If, if it's not, then it's, it's not a relationship. It's a master-slave dynamic, or it's a power dispute, or it's a dominance hierarchy game. It's not a relationship. Mm -hmm. So the relationship that needs to happen, it seems, is yes, for men to listen to, to women's experience, but women also have to listen to men's experience as well. And then we could see sort of some progress in this kind of discussion beyond just the, the kind of the, the victim-perpetrator dynamic that we seem to be being pulled into. Yeah, this is the thing that I, I feel is the most important about the Me Too movement, is that it was somehow doomed to happen. This lid needed to explode, or this container needed to explode because women couldn't contain it anymore. So it's coming out. So let's say that's the initiation of a conversation. But then it started running a bit amok because it's not a conversation. It's, it's, a, it's a getting out the rage, which is very understandable and very needed. But then is the question, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to be responsible about the things that we have experienced and the place that we want to take in society, the power that we want to have, the disempowerment we don't want to feel anymore? How are we going to bring that to the world? And the way that it's been happening is not that. It's a chaotic way. It's a blaming way. It's a female shadow coming out. And I'm, I'm really, really interested in women showing up with men in connection to say what's going on wrong for you what's going on wrong for me it's a self-reflection that really really needs to happen that I haven't seen yet I've seen like the explosion that creates a space but there's a next phase is to fill it with the content and men and women need to do that in dialogue and in respect for the differences which is also what's lacking there's men there's women there's masculine, there's feminine, there's male, there's female, all these things, what does that mean? It's not the same. There is a difference. And what do we do in that space? This is what I'm really interested in. What do we do in this space? I mean, we are, if you're watching this and you live in London or you live in the UK, we're doing an event on the 5th of June to try and model these conversations and try and bring it to that next level, because I think, I think it has to happen in person. Yeah. I think these only things can only happen in person. I want to add to that, that it is a thing that always needs to happen in person, because we can sit here and we can have intellectual discussions about men and women, and our position in society and everything, but when we walk down of the room and we go out there, we go back to our partners and our life, that's where it's really happening. It's really happening at the interpersonal experiential level. And that's where we can learn so much about how am I in connection? How am I in relationship? How am I playing out these shadows here now? And we really forget about that. And that's why that's a micro level where the real learning is so that we can change society at the macro level. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what it feels like is happening. I mean, what is happening is men and women in this sort of dysfunctional relationship is, I think, one of the key the key drivers of what we're seeing in the political realm and what we're seeing in the cultural realm at the moment, which has risen with sort of women's position in the world up post-1960, as men and women are sharing space more and more, which is an essential development, but also there are these difficulties about navigating kind of men's and women's different experiences of the world. One thing I also want to say is, 
and this apparently was not acceptable, like you weren't allowed to say this, but myself and most of the guys that I know, our issue, we weren't raised by the same people who were raising Harvey Weinstein and that sort of older generation of, of men. My, our issues, I can speak for myself and speak for a lot of the guys that I know, were not kind of internalizing rape culture and, and abuse. It was far more about castration. Like we were castration in our, in our families and castration in our wider culture. And what I mean by that is it's not okay. Your competitive drives are not okay. Your aggression is not okay. All of these sort of aspects of yourself that we as men have more of with the sort of testosterone and our biological existence and are not okay. And then it's sort of, no, this is toxic masculinity. And I teach men's groups and the number of men who've internalized a sense of shame around themselves as men mm -hmm. is huge. And this is the dynamic now. And at the moment we're having this sort of reaction against an old dynamic with Harvey Weinstein and people who are raised by sort of 1950s, 1960s parents who there probably was more kind of um, internalized misogyny in those areas. I think what we're seeing now is a much more complex picture. Mm -hmm. And it's generally sort of a castration mm -hmm. that either comes from the family or comes from kind of our dynamics or comes from the culture where it's this, this masculinity is being shamed. Mm -hmm. And this is a completely different dynamic and it's one that's, I think, added to by the Me Too or some of the Me Too movement, which when Me Too says, men, all you, the only appropriate response now is to shut up and listen and to feel guilty for yourself and for you. And it's like there's some truth in, yeah, we as men need to hold our brothers accountable and hold ourselves accountable in the same way that we all need to hold each other accountable. But to kind of internalise that there's something faulty about you as a man is, is, really, is a really dangerous thing to, to give to someone. So when you mention castration, I absolutely agree that this is happening at so many levels in, in, in society right now and in the values in the institutions. And I feel it's somehow, it's a movement, it's, it's the evolution from the modernist to the post-modernist set of values, of mindset, paradigm, that we moved from a patriarchal structure into, no, that doesn't work anymore. We need to, we really need to question everything, and we've done that. We've ended up in the postmodern questioning all values. But the thing is that with that, with the destruction of the patriarchy, has come um, the feminization of society. It's like the postmodern narrative is not just no values because it is essentially feminine. But this is, this is fascinating because the, the dialogue that goes with that is that that's not true. There's a kind of, there's a kind of um, almost gaslighting going on where we're being told that no, we're still living in a patriarchal society, everything is still patriarchal, when it's actually it's pretty feminized. Mm -hmm. You look at kind of masculine values and the way boys are treated in school and the fact that their kind of natural exuberance is now being seen as toxic. We are living in a feminized society that's pretending that it's not and claiming that actually no, no it's still patriarchal. And this is, it's kind of this very tri difficult sort of perspective to hold at the same time. I think it's a natural place that we need, need to move through. It was patriarchal masculine va values. It's moved into, we need to, we need to rebel against that. So it's postmodernism that, that says everything is, has, is inherently the same. There is no difference. And we need to treat boys and girls like the same. And need, you know, I see this happening and even the micro level of, of schools and, you know, institutions. But the thing is, it's a feminine way of thinking that we are all the same, it's community, it's really caring, caring for the whole. And it's but an important forgetting. perspective. It's an important, it, it's an, a very important perspective. We need to include it and transcend. Mm. This transcend and include is so essential if we want to move forward in culture, if we really want to think in an evolutionary way and say, yes, we've feminized our, institu our institutions, we've feminized our values, 
but we are throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And this is where a person like Jordan Peterson comes on, this, on the scene and says, there's something wrong here, something is missing. He becomes a very, very important voice that's a result of that feminization, is the way I see it. So yeah, there's a few pieces, of really interesting pieces to pick up there. Uh, and the most interesting one is that what is the synthesis? So if, if you have sort of this patriarchal system, which I would say, so you've got this sort of conspiracy theory of the patriarchy, which I think is just this, it is a conspiracy theory, it's an oversimplification, because if you see men as just dominating women throughout history, then you just, that's just wrong, because it, it obscures the self-sacrifice that men have had, the fact that a lot of them probably haven't wanted to do the jobs that they've done, and that they have basically sacrificed a lot of their inner life to be able to have to do that, to support people, and the disposability of men throughout history and all of this stuff. Like it, it's one side of a, of a dynamic that... So that conspiracy theory is, is, is not true. Why there is some truth in the idea of the patriarchy is because we, in the West, we've all had to kind of suppress a lot of the more intuitive, direct um, forms of knowing. We've had this sort of very rationalist culture that's done incredible things. Like this kind of, it's created these incredible structures and also the idea that feminine values don't scale. Masculine value, if you want to kind of create a society that treats people equally, then the, the, the masculine values, the justice system and stuff, that's, it works for, for scale. Feminine values of inclusivity and making sure that everyone is included and that no one is excluded and you don't offend anyone may work for small groups. I don't think it even works particularly well for small groups if it's taken to the extreme but it doesn't work on a wider scale. It actually starts leading to censorship and I fear, I think we're already kind of in a slow motion dictatorship of the mind. Like there is stuff that we are not allowed to say anymore. And this is what's really terrifying about what I, what I feel that we're, we're going into. And I think a lot of it is this sort of, this feminine, um, this sort of darker feminine energy that's kind of infiltrating the culture. I want to say, I think that this, um, the tyranny of the mind, we've kind of always been in that, you know, that's a whole problem that in, in Western culture, and that's been somehow the dominating world culture, it's, it's, it's a society of the mind. We are thinking about the world in abstract terms. And that's, you know, that's how patriarchy is based. It's based on abstract thinking. It's not based on connecting to life, on the feminine values. And when you're talking about synthesis, what I think is really, really interesting is to see, okay, what can we create when the clear masculine values and the clear feminine values are allowed to be at the same time? What you're saying maps on to one of the best descriptions of it I've seen is by Richard Tarnas. He wrote this book called The Passion of the Western Mind about, and because, and this is also at the root of, I think, a lot of the crises that we're seeing at the moment is because we've cut ourselves off from a deep part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like this, mas this male, rationalist, materialist worldview has cut off the intuitive, the archetypal, the religious, the, the thing that gives us meaning. Mm -hmm. And I think this is why, this is the crisis that we're seeing. And the way through it is actually a kind of return of the intelligent, integrated feminine. And this is, and this is why I think that Peterson, he's channeling like this, this old spirit of, of, of the divine masculine. Yeah. And it is absolutely essential. We cannot do without it. And he is channeling this thing into the culture in a big way. And his success is, shows how much we're thirsting for it, mm. this, this important masculine energy. But it needs to be matched by a, a feminine energy of equal power and weight because and I think this is, this is why I think there is some truth in like the New York Times article that called him custodian of the patriarchy. I think on some level, I do think he may, and maybe quite rightly, is concerned about what's happened since the 60s. Like we have started sharing space between men and women. Is that gonna work out or is that not gonna work out? We don't know. It's clearly creating huge difficulties. And I think he's genuinely not sure whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. And I think people are picking up on that and criticizing him for it. But, Ultimately, we're not going to wind the clock back. We are going to have to go through and forward and find this synthesis, which is going to be, 
as Jordan Greenhall talks about what we have, and he also s frames it by saying these are very difficult conversations to have, these are hugely important but very difficult conversations to have, we have the feminine rising into power. Power, and we also need the feminine to rise into responsibility at the same time. And those two things need to happen, need to happen at the same time. And it's, it's certainly true that women now have power to destroy men, destroy men's reputations, destroy men's careers, and that power, and it's, it's right that some people do have their careers destroyed and some people do have their reputations ruined. That's right. It, we, we're not going back to the 1950s sort of madmen culture, but also that with great power comes great responsibility. I think for me, what woke me up as a woman about Jordan Peterson was that he was beginning to talk about a longing in culture. A longing. We are in this time of chaos and where are the axioms? Where are the things that are true at a deeper level? And you know, as women, we already know that there are these truths. We've just been really, really trained to not feel it and not speak it. And he speaks to that. But and I really like the way that he's saying, hello men, where are you? Where is the divine masculine? Because the divine feminine has, has come massively into the world, not as a divine feminine, but you know that with a, a lot of shadow as well. Carly. Carly, exactly. Chopping off and saying enough. Yeah. But it's run amok. And we need the divine masculine. We need the strong, the deep, the mature masculine to stand up and say, I'm here. And we need, we need the feminine to do the same. And that's what I feel is, is what Peterson is, is pointing at, but missing out on. He's speaking more, he's speaking more to men, he's speaking more to the masculine. It, I don't feel that he's saying the feminine is not important at all, but he's no. creating a space. And I want women to stand up and say, okay, what is this space from a woman's perspective? How can we fill this space? But this, and this also you were just saying, the divine feminine is showing up a lot as Carly at the moment. Mm -hmm. Brilliant kind of archetypal framework. And it's like, and it's absolutely right that she does. Because men need to find their, their grounding. Men need to find their balls. Men need to find, to stand in their masculinity and say, enough. Women test men to, to see how grounded they are. Mm -hmm. that, that happens automatically. It needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Women evolutionarily, that has to happen. Women have to test men. Like, you, women had a far bigger investment in childbirth and bringing up children. And so women constantly test men. They, it's an evolutionary necessity. And it's actually something that's very valuable to men to, for that to happen. It's like, that's how we evolve, is, is, is through that kind of being tested and standing in our truth and standing in our masculinity. And women are very, there's this kind of idea of men or concept Men test ideas and women test men. Now it's very easy to misunderstand that and say, well, do you mean women don't have ideas? That's outrageous. Da, da, da. No, but that has always been the truth. W women have a much more direct kind of sense of when someone's really aligned, when someone's really grounded. So men may test ideas, but they may not be connected to any sort of deeper emotional truth and they can go off on all sorts of directions. Women in the past have been really good at kind of seeing where the alignment is. And I think men are developing more emotional intelligence and more able to do that than before, but I still think women have a, a deeper lived biological reality of really, really seeing that deeper alignment. And that's why the Me Too discussion, again, that's why it's really interesting because it shows these dynamics because what's been happening right now is that women have really, really gone for men and really, really testing and say, speaking up, challenging. And what's happened is that men have kind of retreated to the corner, gotten defensive or have really lost their masculinity, given away their balls. And what we are not seeing is that men are stepping up and saying, okay, enough, but from a grounded perspective, from a perspective of hearing and embracing the pain, but also saying there's, there's a limit here because the feminine needs that. that it's, it's no fun if we keep running and running and and, and nailing men per se on everything, like creating a society where, where, where men are dangerous for women. And this is what, you know, that's, that's a danger for what's happening if we don't 
have a much more balanced conversation about this because as women we don't want all the power we want we want to share that space mm -hmm. and and it seems like we've both forgotten that we so we're so engaged in the antagonism in clearing the space that we forget why we're clearing it what what I'm going to come back to what do we want to fill that space with mm. what does the synthesis look like what does the what would a healthy relationship look like? I love this question because this is the most open question we can have right now. I don't have the answer. This is what we're developing together right now. This is why I want to say to my, my sisters, all the women out there, come on, let's do that. Let's find out what is it to be a woman because we've forgotten. We, we, we've totally cut off from, from those roots and let the men figure out what is it about to be a man and let's come together and see what happens in that space. If we are all the same in postmodernism, nothing is happening. This is why we see our society is in, is in a, a complete crisis. This is only going to get worse because we don't, have, we don't have a solution right now. And this is why we need a co-creation, a synthesis to go to the next level. We can't go to the next level on our own. The resources, the, the physical resources of the planet, the mental resources our, of our thinking, they are exhausted. They are not creating that next level that we need to go to. And this is why, for me, this whole discussion between men and women between the feminine and the masculine these archetypes they are so essential because they are leading us to the next point of evolution so i don't have the answer what no. is that but i i want to say let's find out yeah and let's start finding out on next tuesday yes. tuesday the 5th of june so we are hosting a an evolutionary conversation around these topics mm -hmm. uh details i think will be below like down there down there below the, um, the video in YouTube. And yeah, I wanna start this conversation. I, wanna, I want us to be hosting regular events where we can start just bringing this up to another level. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to a point with the, the Me Too campaign now, especially with a sort of watershed moment of, of, of kind of Harvey Weinstein being prosecuted. And I think we're now we're now at a place where we can start to kind of move on from, from this sort of one-sided conversation and start having a, a full conversation. It's very, very exciting times. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.